Welcome everybody to this week's Mindful Social Marketing Podcast with the amazing and fabulous Kari Anderson. I have her book on my iPad and you really need to read this. And I'm going to be pasting the link to her books uh, later in the chat and it'll all, it's also already on the website. Uh, Kari is an amazing and wonderful friend who is very generous with her time and very generous with sharing, which is part of what mutuality really is about, I think. Uh, Kari, why don't you give us a little background on what mutuality is so I don't define it for you? Well, thank you for that generous set of comments. And I hope that you know the feeling is deeply mutual. About mutuality, it's something I think people long for. Um, so much life is a push world. But to pull people in is to show you see them, seek sweet spots of mutual interest, and cultivate a relationship that's healthy because it's mutually beneficial, especially for people who don't act right like you. <laughs> You're funny. <laughs> Well, it's true. That's where we learn our hot buttons and our desires, and we get more grounded. For you, the mutuality, the mindfulness, is cultivating people with different temperaments and talents and backgrounds. And instead of fighting, listen more closely. Become trusting enough that you can agree to disagree. <laughs> and listening is really crucial to a mutual relationship. I think that's something that we all struggle with a little bit where, you know, we want to be heard. What we have to say is more important than what you have to say. Or in some cases, I'm going to forget the really important thing I have to say if I don't stop you and interrupt you right now. And that's <laughs> one of the things that I, I think I'm pretty bad about. But can we talk a little bit about what listening really entails? I think it entails demonstrating that you heard what someone said and oftentimes confirming if you got it right. I'm a big fan of those. A man wrote a book called Mindset. We make assumptions that we understand what someone said or that they understand us. So follow-up questions are a good way to thread the conversation to show respect and saying things out loud, you're both more aware of what's going on between you. That's that's really that's really great because I think we do tend to assume that we understand what the other person is saying. And based on that assumption, we go on in the conversation and we're off off track. And that that seems to me also a very um maybe something you learned as an interviewer because you've been a professional journalist for many, many years. So is that something that you learned there or is it something you learned later? I think I learned it there, but I grew up not talking very much. I was a stutterer and diagnosed as publicly shy. I wasn't, I just didn't talk much. But you just said something that reminded me. When interviewing people, if they say something and you look at them expectantly, it's often the second or third thing they say as they clarify what they mean and they gain a deeper self-understanding. And sometimes they say things they may not have thought they were going to. So you get a fuller, richer story. And they feel actually gratified that they're in it, even if they disagreed or probed on some things. Hmm. Yeah. So once we gain that clarity, it's easier for us to carry on a conversation and, and have that back and forth. I think so. I believe two things are vital and largely missing from many, even all intended conversations. And one is specificity. Specificity is the greatest path towards clarity with self, and with others, it's only when I get real specific about my main mission in life that I notice as I go through life that maybe perhaps it's five degrees older or totally different. 
Specificity breeds clarity, credibility, memory mm. And the second thing, just one sentence, I believe threads to a conversation, as you're so skillfully doing now, can keep two people on track. And with a group of a team of seven, more than seven never works. Really? Um, a thread keeps people productive together. So is that the is that partly because of the crowd mentality that if you have a larger group of people together, they tend not to speak out and speak their minds openly, or is it is it different than that? I don't think we know for sure, but I just find it remarkable that it is true. Everybody from special forces to surgery teams mm -hmm. to some other groups, like the General McChrystal who wrote Team of Teams, he's one of many that cites that. Seven can bond, especially if they each know what their role is on the task. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's when miracles can happen when people feel connected. When they do that first collaboration, well, it's the second or third one they couldn't have imagined before they got to know each other. But I'm listening wow. from your question, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's very interesting to me because, you know, we hear about things like Dunbar's number, for example, which is 150 people is the most that anyone can have a relationship with. And in these days of social media, we may have hundreds or thousands of people that we are loosely connected with. And generally, I think more than 150 that we actually listen to, but we don't listen to them all at once. That's well put. And a friend of mine, Paul Giffner, said, there's a room for almost everybody in our life. It's just how close. Mm. And I think when we look at concentric circles of closeness, I truly believe many people don't have someone they can talk to Canada, one person. So having three to five close friends is a miracle. But having weak ties, I still believe that would have done more. You never know who's going to step forward and help you in ways you didn't know you needed help or that they could provide. Those are the people that are mutually mindset, which, by the way, Jen, you're so humble. You've done that twice for me. So that matters a lot. It's a symbol of a lot of other things that you also will do. Oh, thank you. That's really <laughs> sweet. I, you know, I, I learned it from you. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I think, you know, <laughs> we're, we live in a society that is sort of disconnected from all of the people that we think that we know. And, you know, it isn't until maybe there's a crisis, for example, that you find out who you really know and who's really there for you. And to me, it's hugely important that we show people that we're there for them in small situations, not just crises or things that benefit us. You don't have to always help people because there's something in it for you. Um, there may be later, there may be some form of, you know, gratitude exchange that happens. But the idea of mutually supporting people, to me, seems to be one of the foundations of social media. And I'd love to hear what you think about that. I think that is true. And Adam Grant, of course, one of my givers and takers, and givers among the least and most successful, and how they manage it. So going back to the small incidents, I think my, one of my hot buttons, we all have two or three hot buttons, are people who are unhelpful helpers. It's clear they don't learn about you, and they give things. And then you think you're waiting for another uh, ball to drop, where they're going to ask. So it's not a quick pro quo, but it's an ebb and flow over time. And that happens in those small things. Uh, I think there's somebody on here, Paul Bradley Smith. He's a good example. He really understands me. And he'll suggest things to me out of the blue that are so apt. And that's a sign of choosing to notice. Yeah, I agree. Paul's Paul's always been really great. And even though we've never actually met each other, we still have that connection and kind of a symbiosis that, that exists. Um, I think, 
you know, the, let's let's expand a little bit on what being a giver really means. I think that giver is someone who seeks to understand you well. And when they give you something, you feel safe enough to say, well, actually, that's not real helpful. This is why. Mm. And they don't think you're attacking them. They think you're open to a closer relationship. Those people, you'll get iteratively more helpful for each other because you have to be candid about what it's about. Dory Clark is an example to me. Whenever she makes a point, she cites other people's positive examples of it. So I feel constantly affirmed. Uh, and she gives me insights about myself I hadn't noticed. I think that's a sign of giving. Yeah. And yeah. healthy ways to grow mutuality and opportunity and adventure. <laughs> and I'll be quiet. <laughs> you should never be quiet. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it a um, kind of a quality of being a giver, being someone who's truly interested in other people and wants to find out more about what their what their perceptions are and, and how things work for them? And then you want to support them. I've noticed, for example, that you are really uh, great at sharing other people's books. I don't know how you read so much, <laughs> but... You're you're constantly referencing um, other people's books and and their brilliance and their knowledge, which is something that I've learned quite a lot from. And it's so hard to write a good book, as I will know. As so many PR people send me books I did not ask for. Mm. Um, it's also noticed um, when you cite people. Some people are thankful and out to it, and other people just say thank you for citing me. It's not like you want a response, but it's not noticed. Um, I think we make choices whether we want to go deeper, consciously or unconsciously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So on the other side, let's talk about people who are takers and how maybe if you feel like, and this may be too deep for a taker to even absorb, but if you feel like you're being a taker, what kind of things can you do to subtly alter the way you do things? I don't think it's I don't think it's fair to expect someone to suddenly be 100% generous all the time. It's just not uh, in their nature. So how can they make small steps towards changing to a mutuality mindset? I don't think any of us should be generous all the time. I think we have to marshal our resources and find. When we know our top mission, have that be part of our Marshall Down time, is what I would say. But those people who are always taking, I don't have an answer for that. I know the closest I can get is saying thank you for considering me for that. And not trying to say a lot more. I failed at that more times than I succeeded. Mm -hmm. But I do believe in supporting people in their moments of generosity and talent, but also when people do not speak to us in a positive way, to pause a moment and speak to their part of their positive intent, even if they fear not to have it, or to speak earlier to something they don't admire. Say, I know we disagree, or I know you feel strongly about this, as they may attack you or say something, but say, Let's look for a place where we might agree. And then it's up to them or where there's a shared interest to go that step. Anyway. That can move people towards bringing up the better side. Mm. I believe, I'll just say quickly, something that sticks in my mind from years ago is uh, Danny Owls from Brazil called Dark Skin in the media in Madrid. When he was playing a sports game, there were racial epithets. And someone actually threw a banana down in front of him. And he not so only walked up to it, picked it up, peeled it back, took a bite, threw it over his shoulder, and the whole crowd changed and started cheering him. That didn't happen from nowhere. He made a conscious choice when people were not being good towards him mm -hmm. to see if he could make a shift and embody an alternative. 
that's a much more gracious way to respond than may have happened with other people. That's, that's for sure. I, and I think that's a, it's just a more mindful way of responding to something. And, and, you know, this is one of the things that I struggle with a lot is, is there some way that we could all learn to stop before we respond and actually think about it? Because we're in such a knee jerk society. We're in such a rush to get things done and to respond to posts or to respond to things that people have said to us. And there must be there must be some secret sauce that can teach us to just take a breath and think about the reactions before we respond. I think you get the best way to say, I'm gonna take a breath, it's three words. I think that's marvelous. I think doing that too, it seems to play along with something. This reality show called our presidential campaign. Um, where do you draw the line between taking a stand for something you think will be awful for our country instead of taking a stand for the right spots, for people's actions you admire, pointing the light at that instead? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of honor in this race in any form at all. It really. It, it's created such a frenzy. And I, I think that it's because we're so desperate for feeling grounded that everybody is clamoring for whatever it is that, that works for them. And, and nobody's really stopping to think. It's just, wow, it's, it's, it's scary and insane to me how, how quickly we polarize over things, you know. I think that's true, but I think a lot of thought leaders are taking stands they never thought they would, like David Brooks against Trump. Um, so they're spending a lot of time into that. I think it's difficult to stand up for something when you're inherently against something and finding other alternatives if you can. I think it's interesting watching writers I admire struggle with that, right? like Nicholas Kristof. He's talking about how the world's seeing us. And is that what we want for ourselves as a country? So yeah. that's one attempt. Yeah. It's a yeah. learning moment in our country. <laughs> yes. So in your book, you, you use the words, um, see soft ways to make strong connections. Can we talk a little bit about that and how, what you mean there? I believe there's ways that you don't have to be necessarily dramatic, but explicit. And your actions and your words, at times people most need it. You take a stand of support. You do something that's specific that's going to help them in some way. Um, and you also, I call it cascading. You really praise people specifically in front of the people that matter to them. When they have done that, um, I think that company culture can help that. There's a company that I admire that when they were going to celebrate certain employees, they found out what other organization belonged to, a bike club, a synagogue, approached them and said, can we also tell them in front of those people why we gave them that award and the values? And so I think that's modeling the behavior of citing the good and making people seem more seen and reinforcing that behavior, making memorable moments. Mm. That, that brings me to a discussion we could actually have with Dory Clark as well. And it's really about leadership and different types of leaders um, the ones who are willing to recognize any line employee, anyone openly. Um, but there's a lot of different types of leadership and especially in industry today. Can we talk a little bit about that and, and your perspective on what makes a great leader? I've been reading a lot this morning about a connected world 
And it's the enablers who enable others. Um, I think more people would rather be a recognized, competent enabler with others, using best talents with others who are too arrested if it's meaningful. And uh, a friend of mine, Andy Jankowski, is an extraordinary designer of intranets. And a world of internet means there's not more work for employees, but it's transparent who is at a grandstand offers the most assist. So leadership today are the individuals who are pivotal in solving the problem or seeking opportunity with the people. They step in at the right moment in the right way. And I think those are the leaders that are going to be most sought after in organization. And if more organizations had apps and intranets, you can immediately tell. It may not be the head of the department. It may be two or three other people that are the pods, the pivot points, the mm. centers for getting things done. And then other people are going to learn from them. And that behavior can be contagious. We see that a lot in organizations, and in particularly organizations that have maybe an office manager who's really the one who does a lot of the work and really enables the entire team. I think enabler <laughs> is a really challenging word for me um, because I think it's been used in a very negative way many times that it means to a lot of people that an enabler is someone who lacks self and really is fully focused on the other people and what they need and doesn't really get anything for themselves. What do you have to say about that? I think you're spot on. I think we've got to redefine that word. Mm. And I also notice some of the people most want to be seen as leaders are the ones that want to control things. Um, that wonderful book, Leadership BS, about the leadership industry, people write about it, Jack Welch, who did not lead the way he says he does in books after he's not doing it. So it's, you really notice an organization's values by what behaviors they reinforce, they praise, and they reward in other ways. And that really has to come from the leader of the organization. The top management, but it's more disruptive now because I'm working with two companies, I'll leave your name, who need certain top talent that a lot of companies want. And those people, I was brought in to coach the organization. I said, you have a lot of power. Unify together and say, these are three specific things we want different in this company. For one thing, being more clear about when you dump the budget and when you keep it going. Um, and so when they worked together, they said, make this change, or we want to be in a company that does. That change was made in two days. Mm. So I think it's a lot to do with how you organize with others and goodwill. And you have a good reason for your reasons. <laughs> well, that's clarity of purpose, right? Thank you. That completes the circle. <laughs> it just goes for us to be more clear and concrete with each other. That was the hardest thing when I was a reporter, when people would make a general answer. And I'd say, give me an example. And then they give an example, and that's the real proof. And that's where the story begins. That's why good stories always start like an inverted pyramid with all the key facts in the top paragraph. I think that's a good thing for leaders, quote unquote. They cite the previous president, says five of the people in our companies, for example, have already done this. And look what it's done for a company. As a consequence, I think this should be our core mission. Others, they cite other people. I wrote a book called Getting What You Want, which is not the title I wanted, ironically. <laughs> but it was about address other people's interests first. Where is yours my own to coincide? And what you might do together. And then listen closely and say, does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Trying to talk towards neutrality. <laughs> well, now I have to know what the title was supposed to be. Well, I get several, I can't remember, it was nine years ago, but they totally disregarded me. In fact, the original book cover has two 
angry looking male faces staring at each other with a key and a lock in their faces. It was, it was pretty bad. They changed it after that. <laughs> I think that might be a book of yours I don't have yet. I may have to go get it. <laughs> so let's segue a little bit, twist this a little bit to women in leadership, because one of the things that we see a lot is that, you know, women support each other at lower levels of organization or when they feel like they're equals, but they're not in the same organization, but they seem to really try to defeat each other when they're working in the same organization and headed for the top levels of management in the echelon. What do you think about that? I don't have enough firsthand experience with that to really know. I think there's so many variables. Um, I do know that I'm surprised how many companies in this day and age where I work with them where when it's just the women in the room, they say we have trouble being hurt. Um, and I'm just shocked because some of the companies are so proud that they feel they're being great for their women. And I think one thing that I can say for women is that combination of a warm, especially the time when they may not be feeling it, to then be direct in speech. It's a confounding conflation of factors. Say, look warming, unflappable when you might kick someone in the face, that won't be helpful. And then say, well, I appreciate when they have different views. May I proceed on the path that I'm suggesting to you? Mm -hmm. So they're persistent. Um, but I will have to learn more about that, the question you asked. I don't have that background. Mm -hmm. I think we've seen it a lot in, you know, big corporations in Silicon Valley where, you know, women simply don't support each other. They they seem to fight each other um, and really kind of try to, it's almost like I got here and if, if you know, I don't want you to knock me off my pedestal, so I'm not going to let you up. It's, it's very interesting. Um, so, not so much in the, like in the, in the developer industry, for example, you know, we see people who are developing apps or web developers um, in tech, they tend to support each other. I'm glad to hear that. You see, like online from the outside <laughs> to see that. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, and I don't know. I I think that there's a very combative mentality, and maybe I'm misinterpreting that because. When men do it, it's perfectly normal. <laughs> Don't expect women to act differently. Maybe that's maybe that's the issue. And I'd love to hear in the chat what you guys think about it. Um, also, if anybody has any questions for Kari, please type them in the chat and uh, let us know. And let's see. Um, Robert says, men don't do it as well. Oh, that's a reverse compliment. <laughs> there you go. It's all right with the all caps. I think it, I think, I don't know. I think men do support each other well. They don't always support women. There are some very special men who do support both men and women. But uh, I think there's still quite a bit of, and I don't want to call it sexism because I think that's that's too, I don't know, polarizing, I guess. I think rules of engagement for a meeting, mutually agreed upon, mm -hmm. can sometimes help that. Like, please respond to what the last person said before going on to something else. So I've noticed if teams do agree in rules of engagement, it's not a sexism issue per se, that we decide, but we agreed on so they can call each other on, just like the checklist by a tool go on day. That if a doctor skips a step of procedure, you can say you skipped it as a nurse, and mm -hmm. they have to. So setting things up before there's a problem is sometimes helpful. So some of the conversations that I've had with you really fascinated with me with how you work out problems. So let's talk a little bit about conflict in leadership and how an attitude of mutuality can help that. 
uh, say, you know, when, when two individuals kind of at the same level in a leadership situation run into these conflicts, what's a good way to kind of resolve conflicts at that level? I think one way is to talk about the upside rather than the problem, to say, it seems like we're cross purposes here. I wanted to point out to you where you guys, and I say guys generically, could be assets for each other. For example, notice in general, so I go to the general, not just to them and then the specific, people of different temperaments, fast and slow thinkers, introverts and extroverts, um, and so on, tend to work at things differently. Uh, fast thinkers like me will have five ideas in two minutes. But that means that my closest allies are, quote, so thinkers. They'll want to mull it over and get back to me the next day. Mm. So I say, let me look at your situation of conflict here. Let's discuss your differences and see how inherently you can be protective and proactive with each other's consequence. And then I'll say, of course, we're not going to have any real problem now, but we might in the future, and they crack up laughing, hopefully. Uh, and I think that's helpful. Mm. I'll just also say, going into an organization, proactively look for someone who's very different in temperament, background, and expertise, and try to be friendly. Say, we can be helpful to each other. Again. When I worked with the Wall Street Journal in Europe, I approached the chief financial officer. I said, we could be helpful, maybe. I could help you in messaging when you talk to the board. I have no idea when I'm interviewing people about some finance things. He says, time's up. Bye. <laughs> I said, no, I thought we'd type later. So I kept at him a couple of times. And finally called me one time and says, I'm going to board me. Let's talk. And he found it worthwhile and he said so. And we are still friends to this day. So I think gentle persistence is worthwhile. And embodying that kind of friendship startles other people. But when they see the benefits, you're, you're doing behavior you think might spread. Hmm. And we can still laugh about it. He says, I, I've never had anybody as thick headed as you when I try to describe his pitching. I said, yeah, but you're getting more brief in telling me that. Why are you more clear? <laughs> so persistence and generosity, is that <laughs> persistently generous? Persistently showing the benefits rather than mm -hmm. talking about the problem. Say so clearly we have different approaches. But if I say, you know, you're so stupid about this, it doesn't boost the relationship or even things that are not quite that rude. Um, yeah. Yeah. Being combative isn't really going to help anybody, is it? It goes back to a core thing about being mindful, being grounded, mm. not letting somebody else determine your behavior. I feel that that as much as see that but I've gotten so much better. I don't think it's, it's, it's a path. something that you can, get to without practice. Yes. Yeah. And some people give us a lot of opportunities to practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a that's friend a of mine thing. said, um, <laughs> the biggest gift in your life is the biggest jerk in your life. And I said, enough character building already. <laughs> mm. Mm. And Paul Bradley Smith says he's really working with a specific with his right with his wife right now on how to properly disagree on things. You know, that's always a challenge because I think, you know, when you're disagreeing with someone that you don't know very well or you only have a work relationship with, it's entirely different than disagreeing with someone who knows every single nuance of how you think. Uh, it, it's so much harder because they can see right through you. And you've got your scripts down. And you've you got, got your scripts down. down. Yeah. yeah. So what kind of what kind of scripts could we be building in our heads to kind of approach situations with a more mutual mindset to really um, approach relationships with a more open mind as to how we could be mutual about them? Well, since we're wired to try to take care of ourselves rather than the diet we kill, I think it's when we remind ourselves, if I want a more adventuresome, high-impact life, some of the people are so different from me, are where I'm going to learn the most about myself, attract the most serendipity. So sometimes 
Um, I'll go out of my way when I'm at a cocktail party the night before I'm giving a speech or whatever, and I look around for who's acting different than me, who seems all different, and I try to settle and be part of your conversation. Mm. Um, and I think it's always knowing more lenses on a situation make us more innovative. And we have to keep reminding ourselves of potential rewards when we tend to get bored or irritated mm. and say, there's a lesson in here. They're doing something. I wonder why. <laughs> 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 they may be wondering the same thing about me. Mm -hmm. That's really brave. I, I have to say, when I go to an event like that, I look for people who are like me because otherwise I'd have to actually start a conversation. And I'm oh, definitely no. an introvert. No, I don't think you do. I think you just go up and you stand there with them and they start looking at you and with you. Mm. It's funny what happens when you just have the warm look on your face as you have a really nice it. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You're sweet. I want to say that, uh, you know, it's, it's always such a pleasure to talk with you. And, and I think Paul echoes it really well in the chat. He says, we love listening to you, Carrie, Kari, and <laughs> your wealth of knowledge. And, you know, I, I totally agree with that. There's something about you that is, you just naturally impart wisdom and you actually think before you speak, which is something that I think we can all kind of learn from. Um, your days in journalism have done you well, I think. <laughs> I'm so grateful I had that hat. And this, you know, say, you know, you can stay humble. I've got a double helix brain, which means I have gaps, not less grit. So it's very easy because I need people different than me. It's not I'd like to have. Mm. So that's been, I think that's one of the greatest, yeah. Mm. Steve Farnsworth, oh. Yay, Steve. You are too, Steve. <laughs> Amen. Yes. I love your new site. So I do like his new site. You should put the link in the chat, Steve, because it, it really <laughs> looks great. Uh, so, Kari, what's next for you? What's new with you? I do believe if you started the conversation with this, that this is a seminal time in the world. Mm. A lot of unintended consequences is increasingly becoming the norm and the exception. Every technology can be used for bad and good. So I want to see if there's some small ways I can be part of teams that take a stand, that touch things in one direction over another. So I've been pretty lucky in work. I don't believe in solitary confinement. <laughs> good. And it's happening in all the country or privately owned prisons. So working with people much different than me, mm. nudging the laws to change will be one of them. And I may write a book about the three traits of opportunity makers, my TED talk. The capacity to connect with people I'm like you, to identify collective patterns where when we do something, everyone benefits, and I'd be okay. So I think that's my path. But I just really believe you said earlier, the acceleration of rapid response in ways that do not help good behavior succeed um, are very human, but there's ways that you and I can nudge things in another direction, however small. Yeah, we need to get a hold. We need to get a hold of it. We need to get a hold of it. We need to pull in ways that pull people towards an alternative. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yes. And do you have another book in the works? If I do that book on opportunity makers, fine. Um, there's a woman, Sam Horn, who I adore, and she's nudging me about doing a book on specificity. Mm -hmm. um, she wrote Tung Fu, and she's been a good guide in that kind of thing. So we'll see what it involves. I'm sure you're going to be in my life this time, Janet. I'll go back and ask you, am I in the bath? <laughs> Well, well, I'll be looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you. Excuse me. Um, and Paul says he's learned to be much more specific through you. <laughs> I think that's really true because we, uh, when whenever I have a conversation with you, I you 
encourage me to drill down to what it is that I'm actually saying, which has really helped me refine uh, what I think. So I thank you so much for that. I'm important to hear that too. Well, I, I know that we said we would end in 45 minutes and we're almost there. Uh, is there anything else that you wanted to add to the conversation or anything you'd like to share with us? I'm going to paste the link to your books in the chat and it's also on the website. There's a companion books. They're too long for one. Mm -hmm. So since it only costs about three or four dollars, that mutuality matters and the follow up mutuality matters more. I'd love it if people, when they wrote it, told me which tip most resonated with them. There's about 300. I mean, that truly, to email me at cardsyazmatter.com. I won't put you on a list and keep sending you stuff. Um, I, I just would like to cycle back because I've gotten so close to the topic. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really do send those things. And they can tw find you on Twitter as well. Yes. Um, my name. Yeah. Yeah, your name. Well, thank you so much, Kari. I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation and, and everybody who was listening has added their two cents as well, which I always love. And I'm really excited to have had you on the show. Uh, next week, we've got a good friend of ours, Adam Helway, on the show. So I hope you'll come back and and be in the peanut gallery and, and listen to what he's got to say as well. I would love that. Oh, Adam Helway. Yes. Yeah. He is. He's he's amazing. I'm really looking forward to it. And he's had a, many chapters to his life in the recent years. He's been very great and caring. Yes. Yeah, he really is. I'm going to go ahead and end the recording. And 